Recording. Showtime. I hope Jessica's with us. All right, we're now live, which means you'll see people are quickly coming on. And I will now share the screen for that. Ken, why do you plan to burn your personal check in front of the Internal Revenue Service building here in Madison this morning? Well, I would like to protest against the uh, income tax system because of where most of the money goes. Ten percent is earmarked, especially for Vietnam, which I consider to be an immoral war. What do you think of the peace movement in this country? They don't understand the Asiatic mind, and they don't understand that we're endeavoring to stop communism on the line. The protest has but one alternative. Just leave. Just leave. We do not intend to just leave. No! 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 Dow was manufacturing napalm. Dow Chemical recruited professional people from the campus for careers in their various operations. The whole place is like a war zone. Well, suddenly all these fine middle-class kids uh, at the University of Wisconsin are being tear gassed and clubbed. People are tense on this university campus, and the troops coming in jeeps and they're showing bayonets and coming armed and all the full paraphernalia of war. There were some people, the leaders, said that we are at war with the state now. And they were serious. I remember a, a cop going like this with his pistol down on the edge of the car using it as a rest. And I distinctly thought that he was going to shoot somebody. The tension was building and building. And once it got dark, there was trashing, looting, firebombing. Something concrete, something specific, some blast, some strike against the war machine, as a machine, needed to happen. Good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're watching this from. Um, we are showing, and I trust this is not showing on the screen. Uh, I have to get back to the screen. All right, sorry. Um, we are showing, we just saw the, be, the trailer of the film, The War at Home, and we hope that most everybody on this call has had a chance to watch it, or that after we finish this program, you're going to be inspired to go watch it. Um, it is an extraordinary film that that was made soon after the end of the war, um, and had it been made several years earlier, probably would have helped to end the war sooner, um, because it's a very effective summoning up of the history, both of uh, protest and of the war that was being protested. Um, I'm John McAuliffe. I'm the coordinator of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, which has existed since 2014, uh, inspired by a project that Tom Hayden and Dave Courtright and I did to protest the Pentagon's version of the history of the war. Um, that's led now into a series of film showings and discussions of, of those films. Um, we are trying to give people ways of both remembering their own past uh, since 50 years ago is a long time um, and to educate others about it and form, share with family, with friends, with colleagues. Um, I have told this story other times. I think it's striking that when uh, the speech was given by Elizabeth Warren at Washington Square Park, and she listed all of the 
historical movements that had contributed to modern America and the relationship between inside and outside, somehow she forgot the anti-war movement. Same thing that night or the next night with on Rachel's show, she listed everything except the anti-war movement. And when Barack Obama did a list of social movements somehow, he, le he left out the anti-war movement. Now there are biographical things about both of those people that might explain that, or it may be part of a larger issue. Um, the anti-war movement has in many ways been lost or distorted. It started out with the Rambo films and it then went into the uh, uh, Burns Novick PBS series in which the anti-war movement that it characterized or described was not the anti-war movement that we were part of or that you see in this in the war at home. What we're going to do today is have a discussion involving the filmmaker, the co-producer and director, Glenn Silber, and then uh, three other people who have a history of activism. Heather Booth, who is an old friend from civil rights days um, and was involved in the anti-war movement and then went on to do magnificent work up until and including the last election. Um, Eve Levinson uh, and Jessica Pierce represent a new generation of activism, uh, March for Our Lives and the number of black organizations that have emerged in the last several years. So we are going to give everybody a chance quickly to introduce themselves. Glenn will speak a bit about the film and then we'll come back to let the other panelists give their reaction to the film and say something about how their work has been affected by or may reflect on the anti-war movement. So just mechanically, let me say two things. One is, if you have questions, put them on the Q&A. Don't put them on the chat. The chat will be there and open. And I think it works so that you can talk privately with each other. You have to use that arrow to get the list and choose somebody you want to talk to, or you can direct a message to the panelists, which are the people you're seeing now, or you can direct a message to everybody. Um, at the end of the program, we will have some special guests and I will say more about them later. So um, why don't we start out uh, with Glenn? Okay. okay. Uh I'll start yeah, out with I'm sorry, a, I, I'm following the list wrong. I'm not following, I'm not looking at my notes. That's why Glenn was puzzled. Uh, we're gonna start out with Heather, then Jessica, then Eve. Heather. Thanks so much, John. I'm so glad to be with you who has been a partner in civil rights and anti-war and current movement work. And with all of you who are watching, who also are movement partners. I grew up, for my own introduction, I grew up believing in democracy and justice and moral values and believed we should act on those values. And it led me very quickly to the civil rights movement. Uh, I was in Mississippi in 1964 for the Freedom Summer Project, and then quickly moved into the anti-war movement. Um, I married the person who was the National Secretary of SDS, Paul Booth, and was part of uh, support for many of the events that, that we've either seen in the film or will see in the film. I then created a training center for organizers, Midwest Academy. It's still going on, it's very active. And then um, started to run large scale issue campaigns. The campaign for financial reform with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, I was a senior advisor on the immigration reform campaign, coordinated the marriage equality campaign around the Supreme Court and others and then also was involved in political work. Uh, though I came late in the movements, it was a slow learning <laughs> about elections. And I've just finished five months uh, working as the director of progressive and senior outreach for the Biden campaign. And I hope this portends a new era 
building on the beautiful movements of these days into a new era of hope and building that democracy, freedom and justice for all. Thank you, Heather. Eve. Hi all, my name is Eve Levinson. Um, I am really excited to be here today, especially to be able to bring a perspective of Generation Z. Um, I myself am 21 years old. I'm currently a student at George Washington University. I and mean, as was stated, I've been um, involved with the March for Our Lives movement since, um, since its inception, first as an organizer in Los Angeles. Um, and most recently, I now serve as the policy and government affairs manager for March for Our Lives, really working on the advocacy and the inside work that we do to complement the protests. Um, and I know that we talk a lot about how um, we model our movement and we also look at what the successes and failures were of the um, student-led um, anti-war movement to really exemplify what we saw today. So very excited to contribute to this conversation. Jessica. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I see Bob just put it in the chat box, but yes, happy birthday to Heather. And I have to say happy birthday and also thank you, to be honest, because the reason why I'm in organizing uh, was first because of the Midwest Academy, um, as that was the first training space I ever found myself into, uh, where I was eventually be, um, able to become a trainer with the Midwest Academy um, and still work with them to this day. Um, but I started organizing actually the University of California, Santa Cruz, which um, I will talk about, which actually really to this film in very interesting and curious ways. Um, you know, was organizing there around educational justice um, and have done a lot of national work, specifically mostly focusing around youth work and civil rights. Uh, working as the first training director at the NAACP, where we turned out 1.2 million Black folks back uh, in 2012 out to vote. Um, from that point, I got really engaged in the movement uh, around the police killings uh, that were happening around Trayvon Martin um, and many, many, many others at the time um, and decided with a group of amazing organizers to help to co-found an organization that's called Black Youth Project 100, which does work through a Black queer feminist lens um, and is a, one of the anchor organizations that's a part of the movement for Black Lives. Um, and that is my political home. And now I work uh, with Piece by Piece Strategies, which allows me to kind of be the wizard behind the curtain, which is where I prefer to be a little hidden, but support to build sustainable, winning, progressive infrastructure. By the way, I wanna give a shout out to these young, younger people. Uh, I was just 75, so, so many people are younger, <laughs> but Eve, was part of the winning core uh, in our Biden campaign, as well as in March for Our Lives. And Jessica, uh, are, they're both people I admire so much and learn so much from them. And Brewster also, uh, Brewster Rhodes was also a key part of uh, both the anti-war movement, but then the movement mm -hmm. building consumer and grassroots power in statewide organizations. And Glenn, we owe you the benefit of pulling us all together. And Brewster, in this instance, is our timekeeper. So Glenn, who's in the upper right of my screen, so go ahead. <laughs> Just check my audio. My daughter sent me a text that there was an echo. Is that a problem? No, you're fine. OK, great. Well, I'm in awe of all of you because you're all organizers. And I'm going to spend one minute giving you my personal background and then five or six giving the background of the film before I turn it over to the conversation. You know, I was not an organizer. I grew up in a sheltered suburb of New Jersey. And uh, when it was time to go to college, my parents drove me out to the University of Wisconsin. I was very excited because Playboy magazine had announced it was the number one party school in the country. Couldn't be bad, right? Well, things changed. The day after they left, someone slipped a note under my dorm room door to come to a college disorientation session about the draft and the war in Vietnam. And I would say, looking back on it now, that leaflet under my door when I went to be organized by the Wisconsin Draft Resistance Union, although I didn't know it at the time, was probably one of the most important events of my life because it led to what eventually became a, an activist uh, four years in college and just a, a total personal and political transformation, which I think wasn't just my story, but probably millions of people who got involved with the anti-war movement. So. 
that sort of sums up my backstory. I survived for four years. I actually dropped out of college for a semester when I was so confused about what was all happening. And um, by and large, I couldn't have been luckier to be where I was. And when it was all over, uh, my meaning when I graduated, you know, it's like everyone, you're 22 and you're thinking, well, where's my role in life? And uh, after going to the Chicago 7 trial, I had made a decision not to be a lawyer like everyone else in my family. And I had other fish to fry and I was already into film. And my goal was to really make a difference making epic documentaries that might somehow lead to social change. So now it's a couple of years later, I've been working in video, uh, community video, that was a new thing with cable TV, but I really wanted to make uh, one really good film. And I had decided that looking at my own personal story in Madison, the anti-war movement had just been amazing and it changed everything. And I thought, you know, it's the war just ended. It was, it was now 1975. It was even before it ended, it was coming to a conclusion. And my goal was to see if I could make this one film. And it was a lofty goal because I had no money. I had no major credits. I didn't have much of anything except this clear idea and a vision of how to tell the story of the anti-war movement by looking at what happened in one American town. I still thought maybe I'd be cutting away to Berkeley or to Michigan for the big teaching or to Columbia, but I luckily, hooked up with a mentor uh, who's a very famous radical filmmaker named Emil D'Antonio. And his advice to me was, it's a great idea. I know all about what happened in Madison, but your goal should be never leave Madison because you don't want to be a mile wide and an inch deep. Everything happened in Madison, meaning every aspect of the anti-war movement from the very earliest protest in October of 1963, where you see uh, Paul Soglin, who's gonna be here later, was at that demonstration and you see about a hundred people on the steps of the union and they're wearing suits and ties. I mean, it was not what we came to think about the movement, which just a few years later was something very different. And the first question I had to ask myself or any filmmaker has to ask himself is why? Why do you wanna make this film? Why is it important? It's so hard to make these films. And for me, having been a lowly participant, far farthest thing in the world from being any kind of a leader, who'd showed up at all the demonstrations, had my consciousness raised, when it was all over, and it, it was like a seven or eight year process, a political resistance movement that was built, I actually was concerned when I looked at how I had changed, what would happen to our generation? Would we just go back to being, you know, normal, whatever that meant, you know, or was there a way of making a film to remind us of this profound experience that had gone on, the millions and millions of hours and person days? And I thought the goal of the film would be to create an authentic expression of that experience in the 60s. We had taken the baton, I think, in a way from the civil rights movement and initially adopted that sort of passive non-resistance that you see so often in civil rights movies that we saw when John Lewis passed away and recounting his amazing life. So as I got into it, I realized that, well, I had this good idea. I had a great mentor, but what I didn't have was any money. I didn't have any much experience. And, and, I, and I wondered where I was gonna find all these great photos and film footage. And it wasn't going well for a while. I made this big commitment. I, had, I was all pumped up, but when I looked for footage, it just, maybe it was too soon that the war had just ended. Uh, and then my big break came, which I think is important because everyone always comments on the amazing footage in the film. And basically that came about out of luck. Uh, I had been going to the Wisconsin uh, Historical Society every day, bugging them for where are the great photos and where's the home movies and this and that. And it was turning up empty. The guy there who became a great support of mine, who was the head of the Wisconsin Historical Society film and photo department said one day, okay, Glenn, come here. I think we, I have some good news for you. This might be your lucky day. And I said, okay, great. I've been coming in for weeks, if not months. And he said that they just got this huge collection of local TV news films in from one of the, I think it was the ABC News affiliate. And there was box after box after box, and it was all a mess, you know, and they had no money to have someone go through it. 
Anyway, long story short, he said, if you want to go through all this footage and clean it up and write down what's in the content and everything else, I'll make you a sweat equity deal because I know what you want to do. You can use any of this footage for free. And, you know, I couldn't shake his hand more quickly enough. And basically what happened was I wound up hiring a guy named Barry Alexander Brown to come out. He was a mutual friend of a good friend of mine to come out and go through it. Barry had never made a film. He desperately wanted to be in film. And he thought he was coming out for five or six months to go through these boxes and go home and get a credit. When in fact, it turned out to be something quite different. And four, four and a half years later, the film got finished and Barry was the co-producer, co-director. So my biggest concern in terms of going forward was how do we tell the story of the anti-war movement? There have been some good books written about it, but you know, it's hard for a book to really capture the visual and emotional passion of what we were going through. And then my other question was, I, wasn't, I was a young wannabe filmmaker, but I didn't want to wait around for 10 or 20 years. You know, who's going to tell this story? Do we want to wait and see how it turns out? Or do we want to consider this is really our collective story? And so we made the commitment to do it. And I hope I'm interested to hear what our young activists think and what others think, because it really was a labor of love. It took me over four, four and a half years. And in the end, I think it came out pretty well. And I hope people consider it that authentic expression of our mass movement. And now we have another movement to build, maybe more than one, obviously. So that's my background. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. And I hope you got to see it, enjoyed it, and maybe got something out of it. So you want to lead now into the Dow? Well, OK. That's what I'm ready for, so. OK, well, let me just say then one other thing before we show a clip of the film, which is, why did we restore this film? This film is over 40 years old. And when it came out, it did very well for a couple of years. It got an Oscar nomination. It won some big prizes at Sundance and Chicago film festivals. But then it was just really that idea of trying to preserve the history that I thought was so important. Then when Heather had mentioned, you know, the shock of the Trump win inauguration, I thought it was amazing when the Women's March signaled the beginning of the resistance. And it was so uplifting after the depressing reality and shock of Trump winning. And so I asked myself, well, after I went to the huge march where I live, what's my role? What can I do? I mean, do I have to be a woman to participate? It was just a little exciting. And I decided I'd do a test and bring the film back into a local theater here in Santa Fe to see how it would play. Because after all, the War at Home expresses a seven year political resistance movement to stop the war. And I was shocked and pleased by the response. And that's why we decided to, maybe the film has a new role to play, talking about how you build a political resistance movement at every level and how it, how long it takes and the work that has to go behind it. So right now we're gonna to go to one clip of the film that is actually footage that Barry Brown saw the very first day I brought him in from Boston to look at it. And it's a pretty powerful scene uh, about the Dow chemical demonstration. Dow was the maker of napalm, which was a big issue. There's no sound. There's no sound. <sighs> All right. Okay, let's, why don't we stop it now and I'll try and figure out what's going on and we'll just come back to it later. Um, so we will ask uh, first Jessica to give her reaction upon seeing the film and what the film might say about the, uh, her work she has done in the black and with the black community. Jessica. Absolutely can do that. Um, you know, it's really interesting um, because when, you know, this movie is entitled The War at Home. Uh, and when I started organizing, I was organizing at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, and I was actually president of the student government um, when the Pentagon decided to put an organization that I was also working with at the time, Students Against War, on one of their lists um, and called us a credible threat. Um, and, you know, there was a New York Times article that came out that next January, and there's a quote in it from another student 
Um, and her quote is, this is the war at home. Um, and so um, almost in some very interesting ways, this kind of comes full circle completely back to me being 21 years old um, and hearing that, you know, just at the start of our organizing career that we were already a credible threat um, with an action that was like 300 people <laughs> on our campus, uh, you know, which for all intents and purposes, Santa Cruz is a progressive bubble where that, you know, um, so to hear that um, was really interesting, but I think um, it is absolutely fitting uh, there's so many, I think, relationships and points that anecdotally just touch upon even words and phrases and things that we still say to this day. Um, there were some real, uh, I'll be honest, like vulnerable and sad moments for me. I think especially when it came to talking about um, the murders at Jackson. And, you know, with those murders, I mean, like, let's be clear, that was literally 50 years ago. Um, and you hear the black organizers talking and they're like, you know, our other white organizers, you know, we're surprised to see this happening. We were not. And it's literally the same things that we say right now about things that happened six months ago. Um, so to be 50 years from that literal conversation from those interviews and to be saying those same words and the same things I say in interviews and trainings now in the same exact ways um, is you know, sure, it's a nice alignment, but also it's, 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 uh, it's, it shocks me a little bit that that's where we're still sitting right now. Um, and I felt that way too, when we got to the point of when they, um, I believe Susan Collins started talking about how people said that the, the movement, the anti-war movement was dying. And she was like, no, it's not dying. I'll tell you what the two things that are happening is that on one side, it's being repressed. And on the other side, um, we're increasing through the directions um, that political movements want to take, right? And I think that that's exactly where we're at right now. I don't think that movements are being repressed because I'm actually hearing that question now from folks of, you know, what's happening with the movement for black lives or what's happening with all of that organizing that happened this summer. Um, and what's happening is that that organizing turned into organizing around the election. Um, and now that organizing is turning into accountability organizing that's gonna happen next year. And let's be clear folks, it's already, you know, people are meeting, the strategies are happening, they're being implemented right now and they're going to continue to be implemented um, but so I definitely felt a lot of those threads um, kind of carry through I think uh, kind of one other stark sad point that I'm hoping is a point where we can rebuild and I like look to folks like Eve to think about that is um, the University of Wisconsin-Madison is so important. I, I mean, I would say that arguably student organizing is important in any political movement we've seen in this country um, any winning movement, especially. Um, but University of Wisconsin-Madison is also the base of where student organizing was really held. The history of the United States Student Association, of the National Student Association, that all lives in Madison. It's in the archives on that campus. Um, the United Council of UW Students, which does not exist anymore, used to be the strongest statewide of organizing students. Um, and it was eliminated as uh, you know, the right to organize was eliminated and labor unions were eliminated. So that was the top line that everyone heard was that unions were going away, but they were also attacking students' right to organize and it effectively works. Um, and so in this moment of where, I, you know, I see the alignment, but also the opportunity is how can we rebuild the infrastructure that I saw, you know, in the documentary that I'm like, oh my God, I remember being, you know, at campus, you know, events at Madison, organizing with students, going back to the co-ops and staying with people that were, you know, were living at the co-ops. How do we bring back that energy, that infrastructure, that strategy to really be able to hold um, the work uh, of winning right now? Great, thank you, Jessica. Um, some people said that they were having trouble seeing the list. I think I just made it visible, but send me a note if you can't see it of the participants. Eve, you're, go ahead and share your perspective on the film and how, how it compares with what you're doing now. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I, I agree with a lot of what Jessica said. I think that some moments that stuck out to me a lot were particularly the moment I forget um, what exactly was said, but it was something along the lines of how the anti-war movement got so much attention and became so impactful when it was the 
um, middle class and wealthy white students who then were being drafted. And I think that the reality is that that's also what happened with the youth gun violence prevention movement. Um, gun violence is not new. Gun violence happens on a daily basis disproportionately in communities of color. And the catalyst for March for Our Lives was the school shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School, which is not an all white school. And again, to be clear, I'm not from there, um, but that was the catalyst for it was, and the and the students that got platform to it were predominantly white students that came out of that. Um, and I think that that's something that we've wrestled with a lot as March for Our Lives and have done, tried to do a lot of work to make sure that our movement has been more inclusive, that it's not so Parkland centric. But the reality is that the rest of the country, the media, the government, they all took care and paid attention to it once that happened. That's when money started flowing in and all those other things. And so I think that like Jessica, it kind of makes me sad to look back and see that we are still having those same issues. And I like to think that we've made progress in it because I think that we at March for Our Lives and what I've seen across youth movements today is an understanding of intersectionality and an understanding of passing the mic and sharing the mic. But the reality is that we still live in a world where it's not necessarily is there an issue that's happening that gets attention? Because if that's the case, it wouldn't have needed to wait till February 2018 for gun violence to become such a big issue because 40,000 people are killed every year. Um, I think just more broadly, obviously, I see a lot of similarities as somebody who is myself still a student activist who um, works with people who are even younger than me. Um, and I think that the same reality of the base being on campuses is very similar. Um, and more broadly, like I said, when we talk within other young activists, we know that the Vietnam anti-war movement is really one of the clearest examples in recent history of how youth were so powerful and were able to accomplish something. Um, and I think another big similarity that I see is that the anti-war movement didn't exist in a vacuum, which is something that I know that I've learned a lot about from, from getting to talk to and learn from Heather, from getting to talk to my grandma who was um, involved in the women's rights movement in the 60s and 70s, but that really these movements existed with each other and were intertwined, the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement. And I think we see the same thing today. The reality is that around the same time that March for Our Lives and the youth like gun violence prevention movement has been rising up, we've also seen the rise of the Sunrise Movement and the fight for environmental justice and the Green New Deal, which has also somewhat coincided with the fight against Trump and the fight against fascism and the women's march and all of that. And so I think that's something that I'm really interested in. And one of the reasons I think it's so valuable to learn about the movements of the past is to understand in what ways did those movements do a good job of working with each other and in what ways could have they been better if they worked more effectively with each other. Thank you, Eve. So Heather, you get to come back and uh, Heather and I are the people who are contemporaneous with the film. And so part of our comments have to do with whether it reflects the reality that we live through. And Heather said some of where it led her, but she may have some other thoughts about what the anti-war movement led to. Heather. You know, the film opens with a Bob Dylan song, The Hour That Our Ship Comes In. And one verse, late verse in the song goes, referring to the ruling class, it goes, they'll raise their hand saying, we'll meet all your demands, but we'll shout from the bow, your days are numbered. And like Pharaoh's tribe, they'll be drowned in the tide. And like Goliath, they'll be conquered. Those were very heady days. We believed that it was a war at home, and we believed that we could be winning that war and that we could make that kind of revolution where the, it would be the hour where our ship came in. And they'd say, we'll meet all your demands. Now there were enormous victories that were won and it was wonderful in so many ways to be part of the early movements. So much good was done. First of all, we moved the country. We helped to end the war. By the way, the Vietnamese call it the American War, not the Vietnam War. We exposed the role of a government when it doesn't work in the people's interests. We exposed the role of a military and the CIA and a society subverting democracy around the world. Um, we challenged mainstream culture. We challenged a political establishment coming out of the quiescence of the 1950s. 
that said, uh, go along to get along and don't make waves and really transformed a generation. The film also shows a variety of tactics, personal education, media, elections, local, national, deeper organizing. So it shows how the movement itself progressed and the relationships between one movement and another, raising issues of race and gender and class, building on the legacy of the civil rights movement. By the way, a particular shout out to Bob Zellner from SNCC, uh, who I see is here, who's kept on that movement spirit. So many in the audience uh, and participants um, have been movement builders our whole lives. So with all of these positive changes that opened our eyes, opened our consciousness, that this film so beautifully captures, what is it that happened? Now we face an election, just for the most recent, but other examples could be taken, where it's true that Biden got 80 million votes, and I'm so glad that Trump is out of office. And thanks to all of you who worked on that campaign. But Trump got 74 million votes, even after four years. And I'm told that 73% of his supporters think that he won the election. There's a different world of reality that we live in now. And almost 70 million, or around 70 million, didn't vote even after the enormous talent, energy, money, and effort that was put into this election. And so I both am here to say the need to build on to that movement spirit and to wonder, use this as a wake up moment and to say, what do we need to do to add to the spirit of resistance and what deeper organizing do we now need to do to unite the movements. One of the things in the film is though there are wonderful black voices in the film. The movement in Madison was largely a white anti-war movement, uh, largely with male leadership in the anti-war movement, though Marge to bank and I give her a shout out as a remarkable a leader and still is. Um, there are many things we've learned as our movements. It is more intersectional, it is more interconnected, intergenerational, cross race, cross class, and still needs to be deeper that we could have allowed that the conditions occurred in the anti-war movement so that the National Guard would shoot on and kill our own people means that we hadn't spoken to the people effectively enough who were in that National Guard. And even today, the deeper organizing like they're doing in Georgia and Arizona need to be carried on even now. Thank you very much. As I go into my re remarks, I'm going to put the uh, logo of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee up. Uh, this obviously is photoshopped. Uh, Dr. Spock and Dr. King were not carrying our posters at that point. Uh, this is a picture that was taken within days of Dr. King's phenomenal speech at Riverside Church. Um, one of the things that I thought when I, I hadn't seen the film for 30 years plus, um, and when I watched it, I was struck by how much of the anti-war movement it managed to touch on, although it didn't touch on everything. Um, a mass movement is a mass movement of many, many different kinds of activity, including businessmen who printed ads, including folks like I was involved with former Peace Corps volunteers, um, including a lot of labor and minority people that, that are not so visible, as Heather said, in this particular film and this particular set of uh, events. If, if you go look in our channel, you'll see we did a program uh, that honored the Chicano Moratorium, Kent State and Jackson State. And you know, very few people in the US know about the Chicano Moratorium. It was a local California event to most folks, but it was particularly significant given the number of Hispanic people who were being drafted and in combat. Um, so the, no film can do everything. There's a new film being produced now, The Movement and the Madman. 
uh, and maybe it'll get some more pieces in. There's a very specialized film on the draft that tries to touch on uh, the boys who said no, that's beginning to circulate now. But I think this film stands as the best documentary to show people when you're trying to explain what happened and what it was that consumed your life um, for two, three, four, five, ten years, whatever period of time you were involved with it. Um, I think we're after three things, of course. One is what happened. And the film helps, gives us a sense of that. Why it happened. And again, the film is good because it has the events taking place in Vietnam that were motivating us. It was the daily uh, press accounts, TV accounts, seeing what was being done in our name, which propelled the anti-war movement. I mean, there was surely some self-interest of people who didn't want to be drafted, but more importantly, those people didn't want to be drafted to fight in a war that they knew was wrong. And one of the ways they opposed it was to not get drafted. Um, obviously, those of us who came from middle class backgrounds had all kinds of advantages, especially white middle class backgrounds, in how we dealt with the draft. But that does not invalidate the anti-draft activity or the mass mobilizations and demonstrations or the activities in a place like Madison, which were by the nature of the campus, white and middle class, upper middle class. That was part of what, and as Heather said, if you talk to the Vietnamese today, you talk to their ambassador in, New, in Washington today, he would tell you what it was like when he was a child who had to flee US bombing in Hanoi. And he would tell you, as virtually any Vietnamese would tell you, how grateful they were to the Americans who opposed the war because that was a major contribution to their ability to save their country from us. Um, and the opposition that started with us extended into the military itself. And later on, we'll do a, a couple of video, a couple of video pa uh, panels, one about FTA, the film that Jane Fonda was involved with, and the other, Sir No Sir, about GI resistance. Terribly important parts of what contributed to the ending of the war. And finally, we'll get to what Brewster was involved in, which is the effort, and Tom Hayden and Jane and the Indochina peace campaign, the effort that focused on ending the funding that continued the war and ultimately led to its end. Mm -hmm. um, that's again a piece that folks don't think about, the integration of the demonstrations and the confrontations with what becomes in the mid 70s, very congressionally focused, very targeted work to get votes against funding for the South Vietnamese government. So that's for me what the film is about. Um, I want to say, because several people have asked that, that there will be the speakers at the, the guests at the end uh, that are uh, Paul Soglin, who you, you saw in the film, the mayor of Madison, Carl Armstrong, who was imprisoned and then freed, uh, it was paroled because of this film itself. He wasn't imprisoned because of the film, but he was paroled because of the film. Um, Doug Bradley, who's a Vietnam veteran, and Artesimio Romero Icarava, who is a young environmental activist. And they'll say a few words at the end. The other thing, just for housekeeping, that I should have said earlier is this will all go on YouTube. And everybody who uh, signed up, who registered, all of you watching it, the 226 who are now watching, and the 340 that actually registered will get the link to watch it and share it on YouTube. We'll also put the chat and the, uh, uh, the Q&A 
we'll make it available through our blog page. Um, and if somebody can explain to me how to get everybody's names up, I'll do it, but I can't figure out how to do it. So any rate, that uh, passing on now, um, I wanted to now go back to Glenn, who having heard everybody's response to the film, um, he may have questions that he wants to draw people out a bit more or additional comments that he wants to make. Glenn. Well, the first thing, if you've been able to get that little clip. Uh, no, I can't get the sound for it, so I'll just. You know, looking at the film as how we made it again, you know, we had all this footage, we had done the research that we thought were the most important events and we really wanted it to, you know, we weren't going to start with, you know, the worst demonstration. We wanted to show what it was like coming out of the 50s when things were rather, you know, tepid. The civil rights movement was so important, but that was largely, I think, in the South, we learned the lessons of it. And in fact, I like to think of both the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement as kind of the backstory to what we're seeing with Black Lives Matter and some of these, because all of the movements we're talking about, including March for Our Lives, including the environmental movement, they're, they ultimately become very personal and a lot of it is driven by moral outrage. Moral outrage is a good thing because it shows you have morality and it shows you're pissed off about something that's going badly in our society. So one of the things that you see in the war at home, it's really the entire film in my view is about this political resistance movement that started so small and then evolved. And sometimes things happened that weren't expected that blew it up. The, the, the clip we missed here was about how the students had been protesting for years about the weapon of napalm. That's an anti-personnel weapon. And then there's a history to that aspect of the protest. And then they go to stop Dow Chemical Company from recruiting future napalm workers on campus and it was supposed to be another nonviolent demonstration. And yet, for whatever reasons exactly, it blows up and the police come in and they, people like Marge Tabankin and Paul Soglin, who you'll see, are getting beaten up. And it blows up in the middle of classes changing and the movement overnight goes from a couple hundred people to a couple, hundred, to, to a couple thousand people. And those are unexpected events. But I think the question I wanna to throw to both Eve and Jessica in particular, and later on to the climate change activists is really the role of direct action. What that means is to me, it starts when you carry a protest sign for the first time, and then it starts when you support a movement or when you sit in, or when you take a confrontational position against someone like Dow Chemical. And that was really the turning point that October 1967 was the turning point, as it turned out, in Madison, but also on the West Coast where they were blocking troop trains, what's going on in the Pentagon two days later when, you know, in Madison, that was the first time they ever used tear gas against the anti-war movement. And they're using the same thing in California and in, in Washington within days. So that's when they say the movement moved from protest, nonviolent, passive resistance, to resistance. And that's a big turning point, which the film tries to build up to. And so I guess I'm looking a little bit, I'm curious about the tactics of, I mean, we've seen the great marches. I've never been so moved in my life than what happened during the post horrible George Floyd situation. That was a high point for me. It was the largest movement in the history of our country that went on for about two months. It had a little mis 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 mishap at the end when things got a little over the edge in a couple of places, but basically people forget 99.9% .9 of those people out there were driven by wanting to eradicate systemic racism and police abuse. And you really had a multi-diverse, multicultural, multi-generational group coming together. And I'm hoping that's the model going forward, but I'm curious, so often it takes some outrageous crime to, to, to motivate it, like what happened in Parkland, like what happened in, in Minnesota, what kind of tactics did you see that might be applicable to helping to kind of get people back on track now that the election's over? To Eve or Jessica. You wanna go first, Jessica? 
Oh, okay. I guess I can go. Um, so I think you said a few things there that are interesting. I think that um, with regard to direct actions, I think that that definitely has been a very large point and a really um, one of the key tactics that uh, March for Lies has moved. The reality, obviously, is that March for Lies at its inception, some of the things that garnered the movement and the young people in Parkland, young people across the country, so much attention was um, the uh, school walkouts that we did, which obviously is a tactic that's been used before. Um, there were then two of those was obviously the march itself where so many people organized. Um, there are marches across the country, which um, I believe is still considered to be the largest single day um, protest against gun violence and also the largest youth led um, protest since the anti-war movement. Um, so I think that definitely direct action was a key part of sort of where our organization came from and the movement came from. Um, I think that in my opinion, direct actions are a key component of any winning strategy, but the direct actions in and of themselves um, are not sufficient. I think that to truly make change, you need to be able to both um, have the mobilization of people, you need to be able to have um, those sort of big flashy moments that bring people in sort of show the power of your movement, but you also need to have um, the work that you do strategically um, sort of behind the scenes. And I think that it's up to each movement and organization to choose sort of how much they want to work, quote unquote, within the system versus push it from without. Um, and I think that March for Lies has been able to um, has been able to walk that line of being able to have both what we like to call an inside game and an outside game, which I think is the most effective because the reality is the folks who are in office, um, they're not necessarily ever going to do 100% of what we want, but insofar as there are people who hold power, um, that there are that there are two ways to push them. They're not mutually exclusive. One is public pressure and the other is actually having a seat at the table with them. Um, I think before I get over Jessica, one more thing I want to say is just that I think it's important to note that a lot of these tactics aren't new, and I don't necessarily think they, they were even new um, during the Vietnam War era, and I think that we've seen historically that all the time groups who are marginalized, whether that be young people, people of color, people of other minority groups, uh, they've been doing this for a long time, and it's important to note that the ones that get a lot of attention, like the white-led anti-war movement, like um, what started off and is not I, I would not say we are predominantly white, but we started off definitely as a white led movement organization, marginalized, get the most attention, but that these tactics I think are tactics that have been proven to be successful. And I think that how much attention a certain tactic get really depends on who's utilizing it and that that can be a big detriment to um, movements as a whole. Yeah. I, um... The tactic conversation is always a very interesting one for me, um, you know, um... I will say that, you know, especially as it relates to the way I've seen a lot of the discourse play out around the movement for Black Lives and the organizing that we saw this summer, um, you know, there's a lot of conversation and debating and critique around the, around the different tactics that folks were deciding to use. Um, and I don't really think that we can talk uh, or, you know, call individual acts that we're seeing, you know, uh, oppressed people take violent while not calling out the institutional violence that created the context for why people feel the need to take on certain tactics. Um, and I think that that for me is the appropriate frame and understanding that when we're looking at tactics and we're talking about underrepresented marginalized communities that consistently face violence every single day institutionally in their communities, in their homes, in any point of interaction with these systems in healthcare systems um, where books um, and medical institutions still stay, state to this day that I don't feel pain the same way a white woman does, that is inherently violent against me. And then you question then how I react to that. Um, and so uh, people that are closest to the pain um, will often react from that place of pain. Um, I also think that, you know, we don't have the choice of, of, of choosing between tactics. And I think that that's a false choice and a false narrative that actually takes away power from people when we say, well, which one is it? Do we want to engage in civic engagement or do we want to take to the streets? Do we want to lobby in Capitol Hill or do we want to build our own radical imaginary visions of what we want to see? We have to do it all. We don't really have a choice because we don't have the power that the institutions that control the policies that legislate our lives have. So I'm doing all of the tactics. I'm a yes and not a no but. So I'm like, I, I fully adamantly believe that we have to do it all. And so when I see people get into these false arguments around well, what's more important, I, you know, choosing to engage around the election or, you know, your, you know, your legislative work over here. I'm like, why are you asking that question? That is a bad tactical question that is against the strategy of us actually winning. And 
And what I care about is winning. And I want to win because I want to, to the point of the Midwest Academy, you know, values, I want to win concrete change that improves the lives of the people I love. That is what I want to do. And so because that's what I want to do, my choice is to develop and implement a strategy that uses all the tactics and all of the resources and tools that I have access to and leverages it in the best way. And I think that you know, you know, and I think we'll probably get into this a little bit more around the movements and the different issues that relate to each other. But, you know, we need to see ourselves in trusted relationship and trust that, you know, our comrades, whatever tactic they decide to choose is the right tactic for them at that moment and have their backs through that process. I would say as a broad thrust, first of all, aren't Eve and Jessica fabulous? <laughs> I feel they are so smart and they are, uh, they make me more confident for the, for the kind of future we want to see. Um, amongst ways to frame it, I also, uh, one of the bylines, bywords that I use is that if we organize, we can change this world, but we need to organize in order to win real improvements in people's lives, give people a sense of their own power and change the relations of power for the structural changes we wanna see in this society. So that yes, we do need to make demands. And I see there are a number of people raising, what are all the demands we're raising? And it's important that we raise demands, but we also have to know, are we building the power in order to win? And just as there was protest to resistance, I think now we also need protest to power and we need to control the levers of power. And that means votes, people, numbers, organizing money and organizing to win, engaging people to improve our lives. Don, can I just step in for just very short comments? Sure. Um, one of the biggest takeaways that I got from making the film and studying both the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement, this may sound really obvious, and I'm very grateful to hear from both Jessica and Eve, I'm thrilled to see new leaders emerging, is the role of leaders and organizations that both the civil rights, the civil rights movement had amazing organizations and amazing leaders. And it had been a longer period of time they'd been trying to get their rights and maybe that's part of it. But when you had groups like NAACP and SCLC and CORE and SNCC and the leaders that came out of it that were really helping to guide the strategy of the movement, I think you get a sense that there is a logic and a compelling, a compelling argument to be made. And then when something happens, you've got the relationship of these organizations and the movement to these mass events like the March on Washington or like in the case of the anti-war movement, you've got the, uh, the, uh, you know, the moratorium where we had 600,000 people. And my feeling as a young person, as a teenager and someone who's trying to go through college and pay attention is that we were building a political culture in the 60s that didn't really exist quite that way before outside of maybe the labor movement. And we were coming up with tactics to meet the needs at that particular time. Sometimes it might've been a sit-in at the administration building to stop the draft. Sometimes it might've been you know, stopping Dow Chemical. But what I took away was the relationship between those organizations and the leaders to the mass of people who will show up when it really counts. And, you know, that's partly tactics, that's part strategy. And that's why I was asking earlier about how do we create the movement and have a sustained culture that supports it? I think we made the film partly to answer that question, to remind people of their history. So when we talk about going from here, one last point, you talked about Heather building power. Um, Mark Rudd, who's a well-known anti-war activist who lives here in New Mexico with me, once told me after seeing the film for the second time, he said, you know, the big mistake we made in the 60s was that we didn't go for power. You know, we were, we were content to protest and be kind of down on the things we hated but we never really, with the exception of Paul Soglin, who's gonna come up in Madison, elected people that could deliver the kind of change we wanted. And so I think that that's part of the bigger argument now, especially that so much of our energy seems to be going towards how do we fix the electoral 
uh, components because the Republicans were paying attention and they spent decades going for power and now we've got to catch up. Right. Okay, um, we're about to shift gears, not shift gears, but shift focuses a little bit um, with some of the people who are the special guests, two of whom are part of the, three of whom are part of the film and one of whom represents a different new movement, uh, new generation movement. Um, the only, the other remark that I wanted to make was that uh, there are, we have to recognize it in all of these situations as people that talk, there have been hard decisions to be made and maybe sometimes the wrong decisions are made. Um, I don't know in the decision about the, Dow chemical protest and the confrontations on the street. Um, maybe Paul has some thoughts about when people were mobilized and when people were alienated. I know that we used to, I was on the new mob executive committee and we always had this mixed reaction to people carrying NLF flags, National Liberation Front flags and chanting Ho 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 Chi Minh, the NLF is going to win. I mean, we agreed with the sentiment, certainly, but we saw that as turning off people, of alienating people. Um, and we know how the anti-war movement, at least one part of it, descended into the weather underground and uh, ruined many people's lives in the course of that. And I don't think contributed anything to bringing the war to an end. Um, so there's... Uh, this is not, and it's a always open discussion or talking contemporaneously. We know how much debate there's been about whether defund the police was a good slogan or a bad slogan and how much it got used by, it expressed something important, but did it get used by the other side to damage what we were trying to achieve? So at any rate, uh, we'll now turn to uh, some eyewitnesses, as it were. Uh, Paul, you're first up. So, Dirk, thanks for having me. Let me uh, rapidly do some stuff. After uh, Dave Marinus wrote his book, They Marched into Sunlight, which covers some of the same stuff in 1967 at Dow, we had a uh, public forum here in Madison about it. And one of the police officers who was involved and came into the Commerce Building and, and, and beat us, said, and I'm quoting him exactly, they told us to clear the building, they didn't tell us how. And that to me was the most dramatic statement. It happened you know, more than 35, 40 years after the incident, making it very clear that they had no intention of respecting a nonviolent protest, a sit-in, where we were going to engage in passive resistance and be brought out of the building. So that brings me to the question of, have the police learned anything from the late 60s and the early 70s till now? And tragically, the answer is they have not. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. Madison was not one of them. The tactics that were used last May and June here in our city uh, were just abominable. I want to focus on, on, on really what, what John led into, what Heather's been talking about, uh, what, what, what Jess is talking about, and make it very clear that direct action opens doors, but it does not build a movement. Both Professor Mossy and uh, Harvey Goldberg here at the University of Wisconsin History Department kept telling us, you are a protest. You are not a political movement. And that's a transition we have to make, and it's very clear. We're, we're hanging on by our fingernails right now, as when Heather pointed out, yeah, 80 million people voted for Biden, 74 million are voting for, for Trump, 73% of his supporters don't believe that the election was, was legitimate. If we go from 1968 until 1972, with the exceptional Watergate, it was all Republican years. Now, we took advantage of Watergate. And, and in fact, if it hadn't been for Nixon's 
inability to democratically deal with the left, whether it was protests at the White House or it was the Pentagon Papers, all of which led to the break-in at Watergate. If it hadn't been for our capturing that, we were losers for that whole period of time, even though, uh, frankly, we were morally right. But if we, we look at the present situation, we look at the disastrous returns in Congress, if it hadn't been the fact that Biden was running against such an incredible asshole, uh, I, I think we'd have had another Republican president for the next four years. And again, the losses in the House and the losses, uh, the inability to pick up seats in the Senate uh, demonstrate that. So what what is it in that transition from from uh, from direct action to political power that's that's so critical. And I want to talk about it in a negative way. Lots been said about the Army Math Research bombing, the role of, of Carlton Armstrong and the New Year's gang. And I've been supportive of Carlton over the years, but I want to point out, and Carlton knows this, they made a horrible decision that affected all of us, that affected a movement. They went too far and they really had no right to do that. Now, in the aftermath of that, it also meant that the rest of us had to in effect defend that action, something we weren't comfortable with. Uh, one of the, 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 the women who was a, a leader in the early 70s said at the time, she said, I had to ask the moral question about whether or not the bombing was right or wrong. And she said, I looked into my own heart and came to the conclusion that I could not have done that. And whether it's something that's happened this last summer, whether it was that particular bombing, we've got to understand that when you move from direct action to that point of organizing, that is, as Heather points out, that's where it really gets tough. It's one thing to motivate our own people. It's one thing to, to, to rally our own and in effect play to the crowd. But going into that Republican hall, going into that, that, that tavern where you have a bunch of Trump supporters, going into the workplace where, where they really resent uh, just about anyone who's different from them. That's the tough part and that's what we've got to do because otherwise, we're going to lose the, the governor's house here and in, in the governor uh, was capital in two years here in Wisconsin. And I don't know what's going to happen uh, after one term of, of Biden. But we've got to have a understanding that we cannot afford to work with the simple, barely 48 or 49 percent that we've got if we're going to bring change. It's, let me stop there. Thanks. Well, that's, I mean, we have, you know, in a way we've interviewed you as a symbol, but you've taken us far beyond symbolism um, in, I think, deepening the conversation. So thanks very much. Carl, are you going to come on video or just on the phone? Uh, I thought I was on video, but I can't see myself. No, no all we see is your name. So oh, let okay. me see if I can open your video. I'll ask you to start your video. Oh. There you go. We got you. Uh, well, first of all, I'm in total agreement with the words that Paul Soglin had to say. Um, <clears throat> and, and I'm here to answer, answer questions, not to uh, uh, add to the eloquence of, you know, the speakers that have come before me. So if you want to ask me questions, uh, that would be the best way to do things. Okay, so if people have specific questions for Carl, use the Q&A and just at the headline of it, say it's for Carl. Brewster will be reading those questions or Carl can see them himself, I think, in the Q&A and can respond directly. Thank you. Um, so Doug is a Vietnam veteran and is in the film. The floor is yours, as it were. Thank you, John. Uh, I just want to 
uh, give a lot of uh, praise to uh, you and your colleagues, uh, my fellow Vietnam vet Dave Courtright, and uh, and to the speakers today. Um, been tremendous. The, the context for me in the film is um, it comes at a point where Vietnam veterans were actively protesting the participation in the war. And um, we were talking uh, uh, here about direct action. Well, when the guys that are fully engaged in the direct action, direct action are the uh, ambassadors, if you will, the emissaries of what the US policy was, um, turn around and throw their medals at the White House and say, this isn't a very good idea. People begin to take notice. Um, as, as small, frankly, in, in numbers as the Vietnam vets against the war were and, and vets for peace and those of us that um, after participation decided, um, you know, uh, how repugnant it was, um, it, our, it mattered, our voices mattered. It was, it was effective. And I think Glenn and Barry did a really good job in the film of letting that representation happen because, um, People forget, I mean, I, I was a college graduate and I got drafted after college. I had my deferment and realized, well, I'm being deferred for the five years, the four years I'm in college from 65 to 69. Somebody else is going in my place. If my number was gonna come up at my draft board, but I have a deferment, somebody else is gonna go. And it was mainly middle-class and working-class kids who fought that war and were in some of the tougher environments. And when we talk about what was churning at the time in America, uh, race, protest, authority, power, that was happening in the military. And, you know, it was in a, it was in a microcosmic, and we all had guns. <laughs> it, was a, it was a pretty volatile situation. But I, I think the lessons that we learned was, and that America's forgotten, and John, I don't think it's, um, it, it's just, uh, um, you know, everybody's got a sort of mind gap amnesia about that. We did a, it was a, it was an effort to try and um, demonize the anti-war movement. And that's, people forget a lot of what happened because they, they, it was changed. You know, they I mean, they talked about MIAs and POWs and um, we weren't helping those guys. So this was, this was intentional, but I think the GI resistance, there's two stories here that aren't told. One is GI resistance, which I'm glad you're doing, sir. No, sir, you're going to get at that. It's important. It's a story people need to know. And the other is the Vietnam Vets Against the War and Vets for Peace and that protest by active duty soldiers or recently returned vets who said, you know what, this is not going to go anymore. It started with the Winter Soldier investigations in Detroit, and then it moved to what was called Dewey Canyon three, which was a takeoff on uh, events that happened in the military, Dewey Canyons one and two in Vietnam, Dewey Canyon three in Washington, that really culminated in John Curry's testimony to Congress and about a thousand vets tossing their medals at the White House. It made a difference. Lessons for today, I mean, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear more from Jessica and Eva about that, about what they're taking away from this, because I think they're spot on with what they're doing and what they're saying. Uh, you know, for me, it's language is important. Language matters. Um, and peace isn't a word that we use as much as we should, and we don't talk about it. You know, one way to maybe sort of st stop some of this nonsense is to stop creating veterans and stop waging wars. Um, and I think, um, you know, um, there's, a, there's a movement afoot. It's going to take, uh, as people pointed out, organization as well as action. Uh, we had that. Um, it's still going on, I think, it, uh, in terms of Veterans for Peace. And I'm just glad that the folks that are leading the, the new charge are doing what they can. My, my father-in-law died a couple years ago, World War II veteran, uh, was overseas for the, almost the entire conflict um, from 41 to 45. And when he and I would talk about what it was to be soldiers, he'd say to me, you know, uh, the opposite of militarism isn't pacifism, it's feminism. He believed that women, when they got into roles of power and, and could make decisions, were gonna stop war. Well, I think if uh, Jessica and Eva are any indication, um, maybe that's gonna happen. We have to put one caveat on that, given the favored candidate to be defense secretary 
who uh, was a woman, but also was notorious as a hawk uh, in terms of the debates in the previous administration. So uh, I agree with your general principle, but the specifics are always more complicated. Artemisio, could you say a bit about your own background and work and your then your reaction to the film and and what it's saying that has to do with what you're concerned about. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm Artemisio Mary Carver. You can call me Arte, though it's a little simpler. Um, and I'm a climate crisis activist located out of San Fe, New Mexico, and I do mostly regional and state organizing. Uh, I'm, I'm part of a nonprofit called Youth United for Climate Crisis Action, and we focus specifically on issues of environmental racism. And, you know, when I, when I think about like what the future of our movements look like and what the future of racial justice and social justice looks like, you know, I think about over the summer, um, this is going to sound like a little bit of a story, but I promise that it has relevance. Over the summer, um, I was engaged and because I have some training in nonviolent de-escalation, asked to assist at a number of protests locally. Um, and we were marching um, for, you know, the defunding of the Santa Fe police and also for the release of Clifton White, who was a political prisoner, a black man being held by the state of New Mexico, quite explicitly because he had uh, dared to protest the government. And so while we were doing that march, um, I was in the back, I was just making sure that everyone was safe and you know that there wasn't any violence because there is that potential tension. We saw that over the summer and I was there to deescalate and I realized um, near the end that something was escalating. As we turned a corner right next to the New Mexico state capitol from the road, uh, that senators and state house representatives used to enter the Capitol. A number of men dressed like Rambo came out with their guns and their full body suits, et cetera. And I realized that they had started to get into this confrontation with this older woman. Um, and so I feel an obligation and I put myself in between them and I ask her to keep walking because these people are often very much looking for a reason um, to you know, exercise their, their rights um, and to harm people. And then I turn away from the person as to de-escalate the situation. And I motion to a medical uh, medic EMT person that we are gonna need support here. And within several minutes, you know, I'm terrified, I've got these armed men behind me, but several minutes later, a number of our uh, folks came up on bikes and formed a bike barricade to make sure that these armed militia members would not be able to interrupt this peaceful protest. And this one guy, I always remember he turns you know, he's again, dressed up like Rambo, looking like he's about to um, invade a country. And he turns to his buddy and he goes, oh shit, they're organized. And that, I mean, when the metaphorical gun of climate crisis, when the metaphorical gun of like racial violence is pressed to our heads, that's my first thought too, is that we have to be organized. And I, I think we did, we organized very heavily in the last few months, right? To get Joe Biden elected explicitly to make sure that Donald Trump wasn't reelected. But then there's a new kind of organizing that I see as necessary. I think that, you know, during the beginning of the film, the word mass movement is used to describe right, a movement that isn't just you know, focusing on policy on a specific issue, but creating an entire different cultural space and a way of living. Um, and I think we have to be organizing like that, not only because we have the opportunity to and should be, but simply as a matter of self-preservation, um, we have to be. If human society doesn't fundamentally change in the next 10 years, by 2050, the scientific projection is that it will cease to exist. We will be dealing, more people will die than have ever died because of climate change. And that's very much based, and the first people to die will be black and brown people. That's very much based in the racial violence that we're seeing movements against right now. And so we do need a mass movement. We need a movement that unilaterally says the way that we're doing things on all scales is wrong and must be changed. And I think part of that has to do with electing people, right? Um, and part of that has to do with the policy process. I just accepted a job at like 11 a.m. last night um, or 11 p.m. last night to be a lobbyist for the state session here. And that does matter, is pushing bills to solve these failures of public policy. But I can tell you that there's nothing more powerful both inside and outside of the political space than grassroots organizing. The fact is these politicians need people to elect them. It will be the will of the people that will be the most decisive. And to do that, we need to build a strong progressive movement a mass movement for racial justice, for the mitigation of climate change, both in and outside of the halls of power. And I do believe there's the potential that we will see, um, aside from, you know, instead of the extinction of our species in my lifetime, that we might see the art, we might see justice art in my lifetime if we're organized, but we need to be. That'd be my two cents and I'm really honored I could be here. Thanks. It was more than two cents. It was 
very helpful uh, contribution in many ways. Um, I wanted to come back a minute to something that Doug said in terms of veterans and the Winter Soldier investigation. Uh, he mentioned David Courtright, who is one of the people on this listening to this program. David is working with folks to organize a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Winter Soldier. And he'll also be working with people to organize a commemoration of the powerful symbol of people throwing their medals back, which is dramatized very well in, in the film. So that will be going on. The other thing that will be going on is that April 4th was the date that Martin Luther King gave his Beyond Vietnam speech at Riverside Church and was pilloried for it. Um, it's also a year later the date that he was assassinated. Um, we're hoping that especially in this year, after everything that's come out in the struggles for racial justice and about the police, that we can get people all over the country reading Dr. King's speech. Um, and you'll be getting a, some information about that in the future. Uh, but we think that that's something that can bring together many different strands of the movement historically and the, the current movement. Um, and if you want to be chilled, you can go on our blog. I'll send the link, I'll put the link on here, and you can actually listen to Dr. King give the, the speech. Uh, somewhere there may be a video of it, but we haven't been able to find it. Uh, but the audio is there, and it's it's very powerful. Um, so we're going to go to Q&A. Brewster, well, first of all, if any of the panelists have seen questions that they want to respond to, you should wave your hand, and I'll call on you. Otherwise, Brewster, yeah, Bru Glenn, go ahead. Well, I just want to ask Carl a question, since he feels more comfortable in that format. You know, you took, you wound up taking an action that Paul characterized in a way that most people agree uh, it was the bombing of the number one target in the Madison uh, City, the Army Math Research Center. But there were other actions that you took that you thought would quote unquote inspire people, you say in the film, to take further actions against the war. And I'm just wondering, I know in the film, you are the main spokesperson who went to the Chicago convention which became a radicalizing event for you. Can you just talk about the process of your own radicalization that got you to the point where you were prepared to take such desperate actions and whether you also had, you know, what, what does that suggest about the desperation a lot of people were feeling to try to stop the bombing? Hmm. Well, that's a long story. Uh, actually, I have a question for Paul. Um, Paul, if, if the bombing had occurred and no one had died or no one was injured, what do you think the effects of the bombing would have done? I don't think it would have been as, as magnificent in terms of size and magn magnitude, uh, but I do think it, it would have had a, uh, a deleterious effect. I mean, when, when, the bombing took place. Now, I want to go back to 1967 and Dow first. After Dow, uh, I was part of a group of four people that went around the city and spoke at church groups and at, um, and at uh, social clubs, civic organizations. And the constant question was, why are you opposed to the war? where is Vietnam? At that point, it was very clear in terms of the distance between us and what we were doing at the time and the vast majority of people. When we get to the bombing, at that point in 1970, the end of 70, we've already experienced the Democratic Convention in Chicago and everything else. And at that point, the, the, the American public 
isn't asking questions about where is Vietnam and, and, and why are we opposed? They understood that. But at that point, there was a gulf still existing in terms of basic human values. And the, the, the magnitude of the bombing didn't, didn't, how do I want to say, cross that gulf. And that's what we're still dealing with today. Uh, despite COVID, I took two big road trips this year. One down Highway 67 in Mississippi, to Mississippi and the other across uh, the, the, the northern part of the country uh, below the Canadian border to Montana. And all I saw were Trump signs. Somebody jokingly said, we saw more wood for sale signs than we saw Biden signs. And that gulf in terms of values, the values that uh, Jess and the younger people are talking about in terms of climate change, and people are going to die in terms of decency in all of our lives, whether we're talking about the LBGTQ community, whether we're talking about what happens with people of color, that gulf is so enormous. I saw in the comments, somebody made reference to that book here about Wisconsin. Um, the, the, somebody help me. Uh, the Fall of Wisconsin. Pardon? The Fall of Wisconsin. No, no, Kramer's book, Kathy Kramer's book, uh, The Politics of Resentment. That politics of resentment exists all over the United States. It's not so bad in the deeply blue care areas of the country where we can get 60, 80% of the vote. I also, I'm taking too much time, but I wanna go back to the GIs throwing their medals over the, over the barrier. It's an interesting dynamic, what happened in Washington at the time. What occurred was the veterans rejecting that military experience. Um, Sorry about that. Interesting choice. <laughs> um, where was I? Okay, when they threw the medals over the fence, that was BB King, by the way. Um, it reached the elected representatives, but it did not reach the general American public. And unfortunately, we couldn't capitalize on that. I think it's very important to understand that while we're motivating, um, we're, we're, we're motivating uh, and trying to get responses from those who are in power simultaneously. Once that moment passes, we still have to have that base and we do not have it. And I go back to Heather, we've got to organize and we've got to go where we're uncomfortable. Uh, anyone else see a question they want to answer, or should we go to Brewster to Jessica. pick up a question? Jessica has a question. Jessica, go yeah, ahead. Sorry, just one comment I want to throw in there, which is like slightly incendiary, but I guess that's, you know, all um, as young folks. But um, we keep talking about the I'm going to mute it. All right, go ahead. So there, we keep talking about these numbers around the election, and I think it's really great to talk about numbers. But I think the most interesting number right now is not who voted for Biden or who voted for Trump, but the 80 million who did not vote. And I think that this is like, and again, to my point of like not getting into these conversations where it's one versus the other and thinking and then readjusting the context and the strategy is that is, those are the people that we actually need to be focusing on. I'm not talking about reaching left or reaching right. We have to be reaching down and we're, and nobody's really doing that as effectively as we can be doing right now. And that's what we're really missing, right? Over half of this country right now is millennial and Gen Z populations. We're not, we don't have homes to put yards, yard sticks in right now. We just don't, right? Like, and so I think some of these anecdotes are like, even, uh, you know, and love farmers, right? There's about 2 million farmers in the US right now. 
Um, yeah, but there's also about 650,000 certified yoga instructors in the U.S. right now too, right? Like there's, we are, there's about 100,000 DJs in the world right now, right? The world that we exist in is a, is a different world and is a building into a different world. Um, and I don't think that we can fix the systems that we're talking about because they're not broken. They're doing exactly what they were set up to do. They, they were not built for people like me. They were not built for my communities. Um, electoral systems were not built for us. They kept us out. And so you wrote a book that was written in a completely different language. And then you handed me that book and said, here, good luck reading. So that's not, of course, it doesn't teach me the language of the book. You just gave me a document with a bunch of pages, right? And so I think, you know, part of, kind of the ask, I think, especially from a lot of movement space right now, is how do we center envisioning and building something different? How do we take over the systems as they exist and build something different? Because we can't rebuild anything that wasn't built for us, right? Um, and I really hope that like, as we start to entertain some of these conversations that, you know, we move away from what I feel like is a rugged commitment to imperialism and individualism. Like, you know, when you see that we can have veto-proof bills pass around defense that are $700 billion bills, but that we have to debate, uh, you know, half that size of money uh, to go to COVID relief. And they say lines like, the checks are gonna stay under $1,200 so we can keep the cost low. That is a rugged commitment that we have in this country to imperialism. We are not committed to communities. And I think that we have to really, and again, to the point also around an individualism, I think it still happens in our work even sometimes of like, I mean, it's the reason why I bring other people into this space when I name different names is that like, it isn't just about the one person, right? Or like putting people like MLK in opposition to people like Malcolm X, right? Like, it's like, we have to move towards interdependence and interconnectedness as a strategy to getting the work done. And that means really taking a, a full stock at what our communities look like right now, what they really need um, and centering that as a part of our work moving forward. Brewster, do you have something to? Well, uh, there's a lot of questions that are coming in, but one just popped up and it's to Paul. Uh, what would you have done this past summer had you been mayor? Oh boy. Well, <laughs> first let me say that in terms of strategies in those circumstances, every hour, every day is different. So on May 30th, I think it was the 30th on the evening, we had the massive protest that was very peaceful. And then in the last half hour, that violent trashing, property destruction, and so on. Now, the following morning, there were hundreds, if not thousands of people on State Street cleaning up and repairing what happened, including many, many people who had been there on the Saturday before. That sent a message that very clearly the vast majority of people, both involved in the protests and as observers, were sympathetic to the purpose of the protest, but were rejecting the violence. So the way law enforcement in the city should have responded, and, and this is the basis of it all the time, is you get law enforcement and the crowd and the protesters to work together. There was clearly a large enough majority, a significant number of people. So the exact wrong thing happened. National Guard was called in, massive police and a military response. What should have happened is the police should have been there and the police should have been there in what I call the baseball uniform. That is, you either are bareheaded or you wear baseball caps, you leave all the instruments of militarization behind and you go into the crowd and you walk with them, you spend time with them, you embrace them. This is exactly what retired Chief Cooper was talking about uh, in the interview he did this last week about the first time he had to deal with a demonstration. This is basically what they did, at least in that one critical day in Houston. I don't know what happened in Houston after that. But all these responses, which were so military, you don't do that. Not when 
not when 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 the, the people and I say that with capital P capital P when the people are, are are with you embracing it and they are rejecting now after the second third day that strategy wouldn't have worked but that's that was what that's what I would have done uh, if, 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 I, if I ran Let's Let's, uh, Brewster, do you have something? Yeah, else? there's uh, sort of a theme that a number of people have raised in terms of a question that has to do with um, basically how can we get a popular movement strong enough uh, to change? How can we build a popular movement strong enough to change U.S. foreign policy? Big open-ended question. I get it. Anybody like to address that? Well, I'd start out by noting the difference between two events. One was the Iraq war, where we were building a very large popular movement, including veterans coming back and playing the same role as Vietnam veterans did, and people inside the military working against it. Um, I think that that movement contributed to the ending of that st stage of the war. I, obviously, it's, it had resurgence and it's still going on in many respects, but, but where war was a mass event of the military, then I think people responded. On the other hand, uh, much as I like the Obama administration, their entry into Libya and the destruction that created was a horrible, imperfect government. But what came after for the people of Libya was so much worse and is still going on today. And we essentially wash our hands of it. But that all happened kind of behind the scenes and uh, with the US playing only a certain support role and the European countries playing more. And there was never any engagement contemporaneously, nor has there been any judgment after the fact about the consequences. Um, and you can then go on and talk about Syria and other things, but I think they get more complicated in many ways. That, but those two wars strike me as examples of the fact that it depends on the kind of war. And the kind of war in terms of the amount of people that are involved in it also affects the way the media covers it. So though the media, remember the Pentagon did a very sophisticated job. It learned from Vietnam to incorporate the media within combat units and to try and create, but that was true of many of the Vietnam era journalists. We only think of the later Vietnam era journalists, not the earlier Vietnam era journalists were cheerleaders just as much as many journalists were cheerleaders in Iraq. So I think part of it is just the way history plays out and how that there's a lag time. I mean, there were, demonst there were vigils and demonstrations against Vietnam as the film shows so well, where there were 10 or 20 or 50 people, and that went on for several years, and there was quiet draft counseling that went on for several years, and it only emerges later as the number of U.S. troops go, escalates, and people have a much more direct connection, and the media starts paying attention to it in a different way. I mean, I think that's part of the evolution of things, and I don't know that we, I don't think it's a more complicit media, as somebody said in the comments on the chat. I think it's more a question of the kinds of forever wars that we're now involved in and the, the awareness of the Pentagon about how to minimize the, the public reaction to them. But that's, anyway, that's the, my the two next, cents. The next so, flashpoint for an anti-war movement will be Iran and the re-entry into the Iran Agreement. And uh, it, around officially the denuclearization of Iran, or at least the uh, denuclear uh, potential of uh, nuclear weapons. Um, but this is a 
uh, progressive anti-progress fight. This is a uh, pro-war versus peace fight uh, and a fight uh, that again can be engaged and will need to be engaged. So that's the next one that's coming up. It's a but chance it's, both it's of largely a within the beltway fight. That's well, but it needs to be, and, <laughs> and that is a limitation. And when we originally moved, I did the outreach from move, I was hired by Move On to do the outreach for the original Iran agreement, uh, where there was a serious engagement around the country. And there hasn't been that kind of engagement and that kind of commitment partly, and just two other things on the anti-war movement, because it's a, it's a great frustration. It's, it's a great, um, it's a tragedy. In part, movements are built when there is both a values-driven reason that people are part of it and a self-interest reason. And that's why the war in Vietnam, it was both against stopping this unjust war. By the way, on that, there was a famous poster that SDS had wanted to put up in the uh, uh, subway systems in New York of a picture of a child with a napalmed arm. And it had a quote, uh, first there was something, uh, uh, General Eisenhower and then uh, President Eisenhower had said that Ho Chi Minh would win a free election if there had been a free election in Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh would have won. But the question was, why are we burning, maiming, killing the children of Vietnam? That's what would have been on the poster. And there was a court case uh, to try and get that poster up. So it was partly the moral factor, but it was also that people were being, that US GIs were also being murdered in addition to the murdering of the Vietnamese. And it was both the self-interest and there was a draft and you saw it every night on the news as opposed to drones in which there's not a threat to US life and property. So that it, it's an additional dilemma. Um, there, there are many other dilemmas too about the fractured nature of the news. But I do wanna say there is gonna be, that will be a nux place for engagement and we do need to be engaged and organized. Because right. you have to seize the moments. Move, we rarely create a movement, but we can be ready to seize it when an opportunity occurs. Hey, John. Yeah, go ahead, Brister. Another quick question is, um, and this is a, a really broad question, and, and I think it's especially uh, appropriate for Jessica and Eva and maybe uh, Heather once again to address is, how do we unite the anti-war peace movement, which may also include the environmental movement and other movements um, uh, with the civil rights movement um, as in Black Lives Matter? And Artemisio may have something also yes, no to question. say on that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I can go first really quickly, but let's hear what Eve has to say. I think. Part of it is, I think, in understanding like what does it actually mean to bring movements together, um, and I think a lot of times there's just an expectation that in bringing, bringing movements together means that your agenda needs to be my agenda. You need to understand my full strategy. You need to feel comfortable with it. You need to be fundraising for it. Like, and that's just that is not how I think about movements being in an alignment. Um, how I think about movements being in alignment is in being in trusted relationship. Um, and being like actual co-conspirators in a shared ecosystem. Um, so a lot of like the work that I do now is around building learning communities or, or cohorts, communities of folks to build trusted relationships. Because when I look at um, my own work and reflect on where things have gone wrong, when things have gone wrong, it's been very rarely about the what of the work, it's been about the how of the work. It's been how people have felt they've been treated or mistreated, how they felt valued or not valued, how their voices were heard or silenced. And so I think that those are the same questions that we have to build proactive strategies and spaces for, you know? So a lot of times folks, you know, talk about, oh, you know, here, you know, people don't like this tactic or they, you know, they don't like this thing um, or it, that rubs them the wrong way. Well, I'm gonna be very clear about something. I don't care about how you feel about the pain that I experience because you do not experience what I experience as a black woman, as a queer black woman in this body. And so unless you, you are walking my path, 
I don't need your perspective, your critique or your feedback. I need your empathy and your trust and your resources. And I need to know that where you exist, that you are doing your organizing work, right? Everybody should be an organizer. I think is also the part of it. So whether you're a teacher or, or and I work with corporate clients all the time who will Re, retweet the hash, you know, retweet the tweet, uh, you know, write the, co the corporate public statement that says all Black Lives Matter, but won't have the conversation at the dinner table with people and their family about why Black Lives Matter, right? And so at some point, there has to be a, a, a personal reckoning to say, am I doing my job to do, to be an organizer, to build power, to be in deep relationship to people and communities? And can I do those things before I offer up critique perspective and feedback on what, I've, on what somebody else is doing, right? And, and I think it's just the real adage of like, right? Like I don't, I'm not gonna critique what's happening in someone else's home if I have not corrected what's happening in my own home first. Um, and I think that that's how movements should be moving together. I don't need to, you know, like the, the anti-war movement does not need to have the same strategy as the movement for black lives. The environmental justice movement does not need to have the same strategy as the civil rights movement. They are all existing in the same ecosystem. They need to be trusting that we need to be building power together to be able to, to win what we all need. I like the ecosystem yeah. image. Uh, Eve, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I completely agree with everything Jessica said. And I think that it's about one, finding where are the values aligned, which like Jessica said, I think is probably the easiest part. And I think that especially um, my generation thinks in those ways immediately. Like most people who are activists with March for Our Lives don't view themselves only as an activist with March for Our Lives or only an activist with Sunrise or only somebody who goes out and organized protests for the movement for Black Lives. They view themselves as an advocate and a fighter for justice and for equity. And there are different fights that you fight at different times. Um, so I think it's about finding those. And I think it's also about understanding that our base of activists don't view themselves as siloed. Um, I think that when it comes to when, because a lot of times when we say movement, I think that what's interesting is that a lot of movements are also organizations. So March for Our Lives is the name of a movement. But March for Our Lives is an organization. I am currently an employer of that organization. Similarly, Sunrise Movement, like they're, they go by Sunrise Movement. They are an organization. They have hubs. March for Our Lives has chapters. And so I think that that also brings another other level of complexity, but I think that the reality is that when we think about movements working together in terms of organizations working together, I think it's about finding what are the things where our goals are aligned. And I think that that's something that we did a lot, especially during this past cycle was March Lives worked really closely with groups like Sunrise and United We Dream. And that doesn't mean that March Lives is becoming an environmental justice org or that uh, Sunrise is becoming uh, a um, immigration justice org, but it means that we understand where our, our issues are intersect and where do we have common goals in general and the reality is that when we're young people who are continuously not looked at and not prioritized as a voting block us coming together to make demands to Biden we put out an earn our vote letter and we saw that a number of the things in there ended up getting changed and his policies became more progressive we know from the poll and that's exactly what led to record-breaking youth turnout particularly young people of color that pushed him over the edge in key swing states we know that that was more powerful when we when we came together and we said, we represent all of these young people, we're coming together to demand this. And now we have that partnership as we're going through and continuing to advocate, but that doesn't mean we don't each have our own priorities. Um, and so not to be proud of it, I think the two things are one, identify what are the common values and secondly, identify clear, tangible goals and then create clear campaigns around it when you're looking at how do organizations work together, not just movements. Great, Paramecio. Yeah, I would add to that. I think that those are two very necessary things to identify. And I agree with the previous statements by both people. I'd say that there's a third thing that we have to identify as we do this work. Um, we don't just share values. Um, we don't just share moments. We also share opposition. Our, the, our oppressors are actually very well coordinated and our oppressors are actually very often the same people, right? Um, it's white supremacism that leads for black and brown people to be killed in the street consistently daily. And it's white supremacism that allows for oil and gas plants to be placed right next to indigenous and brown and black communities as a means by which to hold, uh, as a means by which to prevent the holding of the oil and gas industry accountable for the pollution it causes. Right. Climate change is a product of racial violence. Um, gun control laws and the ways that they're being written and the ways that they're not being enforced are a product of corporate lobbying, the same corporate lobbying that has made movement against climate change impossible, um, so forth and so on. The fact is our opposition, we have to identify as being very, very similar, if not always and almost consistently the same people, at the very least united by the same ideology. So that'd be the third thing that I think we need to identify um, is, and then I, I would also agree, I'd agree with Jess that 
that I'm not necessarily super invested in us all being hyper-coordinated at the same time, right? When we've seen fundamental changes in American foreign and civil policy, um, it hasn't necessarily always come from a variety of organizations being hyper-focused on one specific action that they all engage in together. It's come from a large movement um, or cross-movement disruption across the entire nation, right? The green, or sorry, not the Green New Deal. I'm getting ahead of myself. The New Deal was passed because across the nation, we were seeing uprisings by unions, by veterans groups, by a whole bunch of different communities, right? And they weren't necessarily always in constant correlation, but they recognized that they had similar opposition and they applied consistent pressure to that opposition. And that caused public policy to change. And get to get specific though, the one thing that I'd add, I work primarily um, in environmental justice and you mentioned Sunrise. I was in a room with some Sunrise folks because I'm also part of Sunrise and work for them in a um, consultory capacity. But I was talking with them and the realization that I think that we're coming to is that we have to start treating climate change not as an issue of saving the planet, but as an issue of saving human lives. And very specifically at this moment, brown and black lives. Um, and we have to start talking about climate change as a racial violence issue, as a civil rights issue, because we have to identify the means by which our oppression is uh, interconnected and feeds itself, right? It, it is our failure to understand, no, thank you, I appreciate that. It's our failure to understand um, the ways the white supremacism influence our climate policy that also allows us to not understand how white supremacism uh, directs national and foreign policy. So that, that would be my point, is that uh, the climate movement specifically, and I talk about Sunrise, I talk about uh, Yucca, my own organization, but that all of us need to recognize that the process of destroying white supremacism and racialized uh, corporatism are going to be our salvation. And I would say, if you want a public policy example of that, something that will appeal to a lot of people across the aisle, appeal to that one third of Americans or larger that didn't vote, it's the New Deal, or sorry, it's the Green New Deal. Um, or if you wanna get even more into it, I'd suggest looking up the Red New Deal, which is a more indigenous focus on it and my personal favorite, and I'll pass along. Glenn, you got yeah. Um, one of the things that really strikes me between then, this is called the war at home, then and now, is both with the civil rights movement, which is, predates the anti-war movement for the most part, you had one big issue against segregation, civil rights, voting rights, and the moral imperative made it, I think, easier to organize because we didn't have 20 things going on at once. With the anti-war movement, it was very similar. It was all geared around one goal of stopping the war, stop the bombing. And we had five years of that, I'd say, movement building when we didn't have 20 things going on at the same time. So my question really, everyone on the screen considers themselves to be a progressive, I have no doubt. And yet through the course of the campaign, so many of these big issues actually got more oxygen than they're used to getting, like climate change, like racial, uh, you know, justice, economic justice, environmental justice. Aren't we now maybe at a time when we need a lot of the leaders of some of these distinct movements to consider because of what we're up against? I mean, yesterday morning, I watched a former Republican uh, on Morning Joe call Trump a fascist no less than half a dozen times. And, you know, it's almost like we need a united front against fascism like they had in the 30s. Because where we're going, when you have 70 million plus people voting for this fascist, scares the pants off of me. And I agree, all these discrete movements are crucially important. But I think at almost a higher level, we need to build a progressive coalition that can fight back, that does have discipline, that doesn't you know, have bad messaging that turns off a high percentage of the people we need to reach. And I think it does need to be better coordinated. So I'm throwing it out to Heather in particular, who's a legendary organizer, people in the vets rights movement, uh, Black Lives, March for Our Lives, environmental justice. Why can't they all exist under an umbrella that would be in effect a de facto coalition to really fight back and have the numbers to back it up? Because you spend too much time arguing inside the coalition. 
you, I think the language which has I, been. I would also say that's exactly how we defeated Trump. Like that was a perfect example of all these groups coming together for a joint cause. We saw it, it happened, it worked. The reality is there's not necessarily one table, sometimes for legal reasons of C3s and C4s and coordination, all of that, but it happened. And so thus I think it can happen again. And I yeah. think I agree with Eve in that I think there is more solidarity, not one organization, what Artie was saying. It may not be under one. There may be lots of different approaches. Part of the beauty is there's lots of things going on, but there is more coordination than I think there has ever been that I recall. One of the areas I'm concerned about is we're all unified when we were fighting against Trump. Now, if we're, in, and taking our different approaches, so one's walking this side of the street, one's playing, as uh, Jess was saying, uh, one's doing an inside game, one's doing an outside game, one's uh, marching, one's lobbying, one's demonstrating, one's building the political operation, all in the same direction. Without Trump as the unifying vehicle, I am concerned, will we all know that we are each other's brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, and that we are each other's struggles are not only unified in theory, in part again, I think, um, well, actually all, all three of the movement, uh, Jess, Eve and Artie have all been arguing for this, that we're all part of a broader movement that was part of the beauty of the 60s. We felt we were part of a broader movement, but will we now find ways to turn on each other? And I think that the, uh, byword of saying it is one movement together moving forward, knowing we are going to have differences of tactics, differences of style, some differences of culture, and still needing to learn from each other. But also, so, I, mean, I am mindful of the timing. Yes. Uh, only in that, which is probably only five more minutes. And also, Carl had offered to answer some questions. I wondered if there's so many, Carl, that were for you. Uh, even just an example, one was, is there a lesson that you take from that experience that might be relevant to today? It's an open-ended enough question, so you could say whatever you wanted to say, and then maybe it's time for each of us to say a final comment. Um, and while some may want to stay on, I think many are planning on leaving. I have something else at seven. <laughs> no, we're going to end at seven, so... Uh, Carl, go ahead if you want to respond to well, this question. Well, I think that the bombing, more than anything, was a cautionary tale about the use of violence in movements. Uh, but while I've been listening to this discussion, everyone has been very eloquent. I think we're missing the boat. I think that what we really should be concerned about is the specter of fascism in this country and how we, we're gonna combat it. I mean, I don't talk, I don't hear anybody saying we, we should be spending, we should be sending people out into Trump country and actually communicating with them because we know that would be extremely hard to do. It's dangerous. It's just like the civil rights movement in the South. It's dangerous, but it's something uh, that I think has to be done. You know, we, I think like we're all in agreement here, you know, uh, on so many issues, but we have, you know, up to a half of the country that doesn't agree. Right. And we have to communicate with these people. I mean, can you count on one hand the number of like what you would consider to be a, a Trump supporter? Uh, can you can you count? Are you communicate? Are we communicating? You know, and uh, I think that that's a big big problem. The specter of fascism is before us, and it's not going away. Thank you, Carl. I think if there's anyone else who has a final comment to make, um, you should make it now. I really um, do. Excuse me? I said I really, really do. Um, I, 
I just want to be really clear about something because I think it's super important in this moment, right? Of like, we didn't just win on like one issue in 1964 and 1965, we won on a lot of different issues. And it was a movement, a, a cross movement, cross issue, cross cultural, cross age, intergenerational group of folks that got all of those bills passed. It was the Civil Rights Act, it was the Voting Rights Act, it was the Fair Housing Act. Um, it was the High Speed uh, Transportation Act, which was our first attempt at trying to get mass transportation pushed across this country in communities that didn't have transportation at the time. Um, and my hope in this moment, right, is that like one that we remember that piece because I think it's very important and sometimes like the Voting Rights Act can like cloud all the other acts out that like passed at that time and it, um, but you know, like my hope is that like, uh, you know, with all the energy that Heather and so many folks pushed in this like movement of this moment to get to this win that we do move over and we do start talking about the green new deal and the red new deal but that also understanding that it, it, it is going to have to be a set of things it's not going to be just one thing um because that's not how we live I, we i'm not just a woman or i'm not just a young person i'm not just i am all of these things and so we're gonna have to see a package of things um and and we're gonna have to have a movement of people behind that with power to get those things to happen so that hopefully the wave that we saw happen in 1965 is the wave that we see ha see happen in 2021 and 2022. Thank also, you. Also, it right. was in the, in the prior time, in the 1960s, two thirds of the American public believed that government acted in our interest most of the time. That figure is less than a third now. It may even be far less than that. And there are reasons for it, partly because government has been both in the in a corporate sector and also has not acted in our interest. So finding how, finding ways to make sure that a government does produce for us, and that takes the organizing. The last two comments I wanted to say is that at the end of the campaign, I made buttons for the hundreds of volunteers that were in my section of the campaign. And there were two themes that we had on the buttons. One, was if we organize, we change the world, organize. But the more important one was we needed to remember to keep love at the center. So we can fight, organize with love at the center. Great, thank you. Let me just say some thank yous that should be said. Um, first, Heather for not just her own contribution, but introducing us to Eve and Jess, uh, who's, and then Glenn for introducing us to Artemisio, Doug, and Carl, and Paul. Um, but especially to Glenn for having so many years ago when we we're all green and tender, having created a film which still has viability and importance today. Um, Brewster has been on several of these Zoom programs. I would say this one is heads and shoulders above the others that have happened, uh, not just the presentations. Many of the presentations and the other Zooms have been quite good and quite substantial, and I encourage you to watch them. But I think that, that uh, the dialogue among people which is because of the ideas of who ought to be in the conversation has been very special. Now I have to make a commercial announcement, um, which is the fact that VPCC is, as many of you know, a volunteer organization, and it depends entirely on contributions uh, that are uh, usually in the $10, $15, $25 range. Occasionally, we've gotten some foundation grants that have been larger. Uh, but we hope that if you use the, go to our, our webpage, www.vietnampeace.org, uh, you will find a, a donor box there. And we'll also be using the webinar system to follow up, to send people both the link to the, uh, the YouTube version of this event and also uh, information about our future, future work um, and 
needless to say, the link to make donations. I, I, oh, I should have done this a hundred people ago. We've, we've lost about a hundred people since we began, but that's also a very good record in terms of, uh, especially because we've gone two hours on this. So thank you all very much. And I hope we'll be in touch with each other in other ways. Um, somebody chided me, Paul, for calling you a symbol. And that was too flip on my part. Uh, <laughs> for those of us far away, you were a symbol of an era. Uh, but we very much appreciate your bringing your experience and your wisdom in to this. So. Uh, Heather's gone now. Um, Heather and I, as I said, she said a little bit, we started out together in Mississippi in the summer project in Shaw and in Cleveland. And we've, our lives have intersected back and forth over the course of the 50 years. So be well, everyone. Enjoy whichever form of holiday you celebrate uh, with whomever you're able to celebrate it. Um, we are at least can see the end of one of the plagues that has consumed us for four years. And the other also seems to be ending, but it'll take a few more months for that to happen. And when we can, can have meetings together and be able to hug each other. But this is what my siblings, we have as others probably do, we have a call amongst my I'm the oldest of six and we do once a week a call and we always end up like this, which my sister told me is what you do when you're hugging each other through a Zoom. So hugs to everybody, abrazos to everyone, and we'll see you again. Hit the Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.